That's a bit better. Whoa. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, great to see everybody here. So we're here today to discuss what should edtech startups know about how learners learn. So I hope you're all looking forward to it. I'm certainly looking forward to it. I work for an edtech startup, so I'm very intrigued to hear what our speaker's going to say. Uh, my name's Daisy Christodoulou. I'm from the UK. I work for a company called No More Marking. And we have uh, our two very distinguished speakers here uh, to discuss this with us today. So uh, on my left, we have Philip, uh, Philip Schmidt. Philip is director of the Media Lab Learning Initiative at MIT Media Lab. On my right, we've got Justine Cassell. Um, she's the Associate Dean of Technology Strategy and Impact for the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. So two speakers who are going to guide us through what should edtech startups know about how learners learn. And how we're going to start is we're going to start with an opening statement from each speaker. Then we'll have a bit of a moderated discussion. And then I'll throw it open to the floor to get some of your thoughts, some of your questions. So uh, I will start now with Philip. Philip, uh, over to you. Sure. OK, thank you. Um, excited to be here. It's obviously, for people interested in learning, uh, this is an exciting time. There's a lot more that we're st Can you hear that? Sound yep. OK? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, there's a lot more we know about how people learn. There's a lot more we're going to know about how people learn in the future. And um, I think it's exciting to try to translate that into applications and experiences that actually are accessible to students. Um, I'm not a learning scientist. And when I got asked to come and speak in this session, I actually wrote back, you know, I don't think I'm the right person because I'm actually moderately skeptical often of when I read about learning sciences because I think on one hand, in education, we're not paying enough attention to how people really learn. But on the other hand, I often see kind of the, this um, very narrow focus on some kind of a sign, uh, finding from a lab that then gets put into an iPhone app. And the, the hope is that somehow that technology is going to magically uh, transform education when we all know that education is much more complicated and complex than the context uh, counts. So uh, moderately skeptical, of course, I work with uh, a group of researchers at the Media Lab. Uh, I, I manage a fellowship for uh, learning researchers who use all kinds of different technologies uh, to understand how people learn and build better ways uh, for people to learn. And in my um, work where I would consider myself more of a designer of learning experiences and technologies to support learning, um, I'm of course very interested in a scientific approach to understanding how people are using the technology, how we can improve this technology. And so I'm a fan of science. Uh, I'm also a fan of intuition and gut feeling and some things that maybe science isn't able to explain yet. And I think there's a lot we can learn uh, from asking a master educator about their experience and their understanding and how they have kind of developed that, uh, that understanding and then translating that into technology. Um, uh, so I guess if I was going to make, if I was going to, oh, they already put my slide up. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was going to try to make one point kind of for the whole session, it's that I think science and art are great ways of asking questions and exploring the unknown. And design and engineering are great ways of trying to answer those questions. But that we really should be thinking about those four things in an integrated way, rather than someone does the science, someone does the implementation, and like kind of separating those, um, those people. And I only we weren't allowed to bring slides, so I broke the rules. Uh, and I did bring one slide because it, it's uh, both, it's a, it's a great slide, but also it highlights something that I think is important. Um, so this is uh, one of uh, my colleagues at the Media Lab, <coughs> Ros Picar, runs a research group called Effective Computing. And she is interested in things like uh, electrodermal activity, which is a, a proxy for engagement and how engaged are people when they're doing all kinds of activities. And so one of her students wore a wristband for a week and uh, uh, tracked what he was doing. And then they plotted this in this nice graph. So this is one week in the life of an MIT student. <coughs> uh, N equals one, so w with that caveat. Um, but the interesting thing is if you look at the different things that the student does, you know, during sleep, as you would expect, there's a lot of activity kind of initially, you know, the up and down. Um, when, when he's in an exam, there's a lot of engagement, obviously very stressful experience. The lab is pretty. But the most, the lowest level of engagement, and maybe not everyone can see that, is on the right here, the yellow bars, is when the student sits in class. Um, so you could, you could argue um, 
that uh, at least we know the student isn't sleeping in class because if he was sleeping, the uh, electrodermal activity would be higher. Um, but it's, of course, if you believe that there's some correlation between engagement and learning, then this is a problem. Uh, if the education system is designed to uh, support learning in a setting that looks like, um, like a class or a lecture. Um, and so I think that what the, the thing I take away from this is um, science is, is great to question our assumptions, right? So we have this assumption that learning looks a certain way or education has to look a certain way. And sometimes science can, can help us question that but it also sometimes then pushes up us to ask much bigger question than maybe we set out to ask. Because um, you know, there, what, what do we take away from this? One is we could transform the way that classes work or maybe we could get rid of classes. But those are questions that probably if you're trying to build an education technology, they're not the kind of answers you were looking for initially. You were maybe looking for a small tweak or a small improvement, whereas this is kind of suggesting maybe the whole system needs to be changed or rethought or reimagined. So um, I think both interesting that science kind of asks those big questions, but also then what do we do with this? Great. Thanks very much, Philip. Justine. What Philip says is really very interesting. And he started out by talking about context and how important context is. And, and I should give you just a, a couple of seconds of background. I um, work in a research lab. I, I direct a research lab with undergraduates and often high school students and postgraduate students and postdoctoral scholars uh, and visiting scholars from around the world. And the reason most of them come to my lab is that I insist that they both learn how to understand human behavior and learn how to design machines that are suited to human behavior. So rather separating it into the two quite dangerous um, groups that I think you talked about, learning scientists, the famous learning scientists who are going to tell us the truth, and the famous engineers who are going to make magic happen in machines, we do an iterative design process where first we understand what people do in a particular context. We design a technology that we think can, can bootstrap a desired behavior in that context, for example, walking more. Um, a Fitbit helps you with that. Um, and then we see how it works, and it always fails along some important dimension, and so we go back to people. And if you can show the slide up here, what I've discovered over uh, 25 years of doing this is that learning is very simple, but it's not looking at information. It's not being given knowledge. Because it turns out that students are very different than brains with a funnel stuck in them. And it would be so nice if we could think of students as beautiful vessels into which we were able to build an engineering funnel and take from that vast internet the most important books, the most important things that have ever been said, and pour them into the funnel. Why doesn't that work? <coughs> well, the reason you hear so much less about MOOCs this year than you did last year, and even less than you did the year before, is because it turns out that when students take a class over the internet, mostly what they do is to watch a lecture on videotape. And the data show that when you watch a lecture on videotape, you go away believing that the videotape upholds the beliefs you came into that classroom with. It's a lovely stat because that encapsulates why classrooms often don't work and why technology for learning often doesn't work because we are not vessels, no matter how precious knowledge is. And I don't know if you're having trouble with that one slide, <coughs> but I'd like to show you how people do learn. And I'll start talking about it while you struggle to, to get it up on the screen. People learn through conflict. Every single instance of learning is a conflict, either within a person or between two or more people. 
And that's just a well-known hundred of years old stat. Piaget said it, that cognitive conflict is what leads to learning. When we hold a strong belief and we are challenged by another belief in a way where we are forced to engage that other belief, we learn. Simple. And that's why lectures don't work, because you're not forced to engage. But learners left alone without a lecture and in a learning environment where they can argue with one another and usually where there's no teacher around so that the argument doesn't get shut down by teachers worried that this is bad behavior. Learners will argue and in that argument is the seed of learning. And uh, on this slide that I will reenact for you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna crawl around on the ground part, but I'll do the rest of it. So there are different contexts in which young people are becoming curious and learning. And in my lab these days, we're using machine learning to predict when curiosity rises out of and as a function of the behavior of a group of learners. And we can do that with machine learning very well, in fact. And it turns out that while curiosity rises when a learner is faced with internal cognitive conflict, it's way more likely to arise when a group of learners argue about what is going to make, for example, a Rube Goldberg machine with a marble that's going to roll down a long system the longest system they can build. Curiosity rises, and curiosity leads to exploration. Exploration leads to knowledge, and that conflict with knowledge leads to learning. So I would say if there's one thing you have to know, it's that presenting information is not going to make learners learn. It's not going to help them. Learning is fundamentally social social within ourselves, which is an odd kind of thing to say, and social amongst learners. That's the powerful learning environment that we can build with technology and that we want to aim for. Great, well thanks very much. Two very thought-provoking uh, statements there. So, Actually, can I, can yeah, I go for it. So I love the, mm. uh, it's not the funnel, Right, but the funnel is the dream, right? Like that's what even in edtech, like so much of the innovation is still um, looks at the learner as something that you can somehow put something in, or that you can somehow manipulate to make that learning happen. Whereas um, I think the way you described it, which is probably also on the slide, which maybe at one point we'll get to see, um, it's more uh, like there are certain things that you can cultivate. You can create environments in which learning will take place, but that doesn't mean you're putting the, the content or the knowledge into someone's head. They are still constructing that. That, that learning still is a constructive process. So I, I think that's, that's a very important point. And I think especially in edtech, I, I, I still look at a lot of the innovations that I see today, the MOOCs, for example, and they do look like uh, the old picture. Ah, there we are. Yeah, um, that's correct what you're saying, Philip. That's absolutely correct. A lot of ed tech is still a funnel, or a channel, um, a Skype, or some other kind of funnel, whether it's up and down or sideways. Mm -hmm. That's not working. Mm -hmm. And I should say there, let me give a quick shout out to metrics and evaluation. Because it's so easy to think that we were once students, perhaps, if lucky, still students, and we learned, and so we must know something essential about learning. Maybe we were the best in our class, and so we must know how to build learning technologies. And in my lab, we look at a lot of technologies and we compare them to what we build, and it's the ones that inspire that internal co cognitive conflict, but increasingly the ones that create a social context for learning that we evaluate as being um, the most effective. Yeah, I think you're right there. And I, and I hope we can come back to the social, because I think that just social <laughs> is such a big theme, but I, don't, I also don't want to no, no. the session before. Let's, let's go, so yeah, let's discuss the social. Yeah, 
that. So go for well, it. Well, so one one of the things that I I found, uh, and I think this is tying it back to some of the more advanced science that's happening around the brain these days that I thought was really exciting is that, um, you know, I've kind of I think a lot of people have always bought into this idea of learning as social, um, but now we're starting to see evidence for that coming from machine learning or the brain sciences. And so there's kind of a new range of studies around language acquisition among very young children. So like really early uh, stages, first language. Um, and uh, they're seeing that uh, essentially as children are listening to sounds, they're starting to make sense of the different characteristic sounds of a particular mm -hmm. language. And um, they're, they're primed to do this when the person who's speaking is meaningful to them. And so when you, when, you're, when you put the child in a room with a caring adult, someone who plays a role in their lives, the brain will be paying attention to the sounds that, they're he that it's hearing from, or the child's hearing from this adult. If you replace the adult with video or audio, the child's brain will not uh, go through the same process. And so that's, to me, that's super exciting that we now have science that, in it's early stages, so you know, who knows what this will look like in a few years, but uh, I, I think that's an interesting finding from science. And then that kind of confirms, I think, some of the things you've said ultimately, which is you need other people that are meaningful in some way. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them or that they're your parents, but you engage with them. There's you know, a level of engagement. Um, mm -hmm. And that some of those things can actually not be replaced by technology. So just putting a video there mm -hmm. will not, for some reason, the brain will not have the same response to the content when it comes to a video. However, technology can be caring and empathetic sure. and inspire those, um, that same kind of learning. So a very recent result from my lab is um, and any of you who were here last year may have had the chance to interact with Alex, the virtual peer. Alex is a life-size cartoon the size of an um, eight or nine-year-old, uh, which is the target age we're looking at, and we're looking at science learning. And we believed that the way Alex spoke, that is whether Alex spoke the child's own non-mainstream dialect, like um, a Newcastle Geordie accent, as opposed to a received pronunciation Cambridge accent would affect the child's learning. And it turned out that it did. When Alex spoke the child's own dialect, the child learned more. But when we applied machine learning algorithms to find out why that was the case, really just complicated statistics, we found out this wild thing, which is that the feeling of rapport, of interpersonal relationships, that the child felt with the agent mediated learning. What that means is, yes, when Alex spoke the child's dialect, the child learned more. But the more the child felt a relationship with that virtual peer, the higher the learning was. And so, and, and I have to quote you, Carla, because Carla told me she missed Alex this year <laughs> because Alex, you know, it's a cold cartoon on a, on a screen, but damn if Alex isn't really warm and someone you want to spend time with. I miss Alex when I'm on the road. That's weird. I built Alex. I know every module that runs it. And so that rapport needs to happen in a human-human context. However, in classrooms where there aren't enough teachers for students, where um, there's 40 kids and one teacher at the front, and the paradigm is to watch a video so that the teacher can go off and do something else. We can help those students in doing hands-on learning with a piece of technology that children feel respects them and cares about them. Um, yeah, actually, so the study that I mentioned is like, it's a very narrow uh, case of early childhood language acquisition, right? So like, I wouldn't extrapolate from there. And actually, there's a student that I work with in Cynthia Brazil's group, Personal and Robots, whose work um, totally confirms what you just uh, talked about. Um, they build, so the group is called Personal and Robots, and they design these um, robotic learning companions, essentially, that work mm -hmm. alongside children and parents and educators. Uh, and they, they try to understand like what's the right relationship that a child would have with a robot. How do you design a robot to you know, uh, have a constructive relationship? 
and they found that um, when uh, the robot, uh, you know, it's just micro cues in a conversation with the robot. If the robot nods at the right time, or when you pause, the robot says uh, y yes. Or it's like these in these things that we do uh, without thinking about them. Uh, the child <coughs> trusts that robot more <coughs> than a robot who doesn't do those things. So it's also dangerous, right? Like, because I mean, we're we're so easily manipulated as humans. Like we we. We put so much emotion in the relationship with the technology, and you know if the designers aren't careful, they they could use that for it's maybe not optimal means. Such a good point that you bring up. First, I have to say that I am proud of Cynthia, having been on her PhD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not surprising to me that her work does this, <laughs> nor that it's successful. Um, and there are there is a lot of fear about whether we can be manipulated. And I have to say that I have more faith in students than a lot of people do. Um, there's somebody at Stanford who works on what he calls persuasive technologies. And we, we worry, a lot of people are worried about his work, that we can be persuaded of something without knowing it. And yet uh, an ABC um, television crew came in to see our virtual peers at one point and they said, so you're basically destroying these children's sense of the social world. They're not gonna be able to tell the difference between real people and virtual people. And I said, empirical question, go ask them. And so they did. And all the kids had the same response. <sighs> that was, for those of you who couldn't see it, an eye roll and a <laughs> sigh. They all said, no. It is not a real person, as if adults are really stupid and you have to slowly explain mm. to them the way the world works. But it's kind of like a video game, but better. It's kind of like a Pokemon, but it does a lot more. It's hard to explain, but it's not a person. So um, especially young learners are far more open than we are to suspending disbelief because they can have an engaging experience. It doesn't mean that they've lost that basic sense that children have of the real and the fake, the true and the false. And there's been a lot of research on that by Sue Carey and other developmental psychologists. So it's wonderful to, to regain our faith in, in learners. Yeah, and in the, with the personal robots, uh, the children get asked the same thing, and they're v crystal clear that these are not people. Right. Like these are something else. But you can still have a meaningful relationship with them. You can still engage with them. But yeah, the children, are, and it's actually what I think is fascinating observing children engage with technology like this tells you a lot about how children think and how children learn. So it's like you're designing technology for them to learn, but as you watch them use that technology, there's actually a lot of new things that are coming out of that. Um, so, or children teaching technology, I think is, is uh, fascinating, uh, or yeah. children teaching adults as well, but um, so observing a child teaching a robot storytelling yeah. and correcting it is, it's, uh, is an interesting, uh, I think, learning setting that's kind of the opposite of what we, what we usually think of. Thank you for bringing up that point. Those systems are called teachable agents, mm -hmm. and they were developed by Gautam Biswas, and um, who's at Vanderbilt, and Dan Schwartz at Stanford. And um, one of the systems we built engaged a teachable agent, although it also did other things. And one of the kids said to this system, Sam, that was a good story, Sam, but try and tell a longer one next time because they like it when you tell long stories, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. Here's a kid explaining to an imaginary character what the experimenters want to see. And it gives you a sense of why this is a helpful learning tool, because they are engaged in the success of this computational system. And all the data on tutoring, for example, shows that in peer tutoring, um, even up to adults, but most of our data goes up to the age of 15 or 16, when learners tutor one another, it's the tutor who acquires more knowledge than the 2T, which is why these, this teachable agent paradigm is so powerful. Thank you, Omar. 
Well, I, I, I mean, we can keep going. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm extremely um, envious that you had the chance to work with Seymour Papert, um, who, uh, for those of you who don't know, was at the Media Lab in the very early days, one of the founding faculty members and really one of the leading thinkers in some of the early work around how children could be learning with technology. And he, I think, famously said at one point, um, it's about children programming computers, not computers programming children. Yeah. Um, and I think I try to remember that all the time, and especially in ed tech, I think that's one of those, like as you're working on a new uh, technology, I think it's worth asking yourself, is this a technology that's gonna program children, or is it a technology that children can master, or be in charge of, or control, or use in however they wanna use it, and be generative with it? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So if I chip in with a question here. Sure. Um, so <laughs> really fascinating, fascinating to think about those uh, uh, personal robots as well. Um, what would you say then for the, for the people out here involved in edtech startups or those looking at technologies in the classroom, what are the, is there one or two practical examples of organizations who are doing things in this space that you think are really successful and we should, we should do more of? Any, any examples from the community? I mean, what's uh, actually, uh, Cynthia, so Cynthia Brazil, we, who we mentioned before, has a startup company yeah. and has a robot, and I'm, the name is now escaping me, but Jibo. it was, yes, yeah. uh, it was on the cover of Time magazine recently, and so if you search yeah. for her and her work, I would, yeah. you know, I would say that's worth yeah. uh, looking at. Great. Um, Great. I mean, you, you, there must be a, a ton of things yeah. that you're involved in. Well, Jibo is actually not an ed tech. Um, robot Jibo is a personal assistant to a family. Right. And what she's done in order to be successful is really minimize its abilities. It's very much like Alexa or Cortana or Google Now. Um, it bleeps happily and sighs meaningfully. <laughs> but it, it's all based on um, slight tilts of a round screen, and that's around it. Um, and, and it is quite effective, of course, because we're so sensitive to those cues. I, I think if I were to give one sentence to those of you who are working on startups, it would be to reiterate um, that I would ask you to avoid presenting screens to learners, presenting videos, presenting information to learners, and concentrate on engagement. One of my colleagues, Ken Cadinger, was able to demonstrate that if he took a MOOC and had students engage with the problems that the MOOC showed, he was able to um, triple their learning gains over the course of that single session. And, and that's something to keep in mind. His work is very powerful. It's very cognitivist. It's not, it's, it doesn't concentrate on the social environment but it is very successful as a, a system of its sort. And then I would encourage you to think about what you get from the social world, and don't avoid that, don't be scared of that. Think meaningfully about how you can engage other people, and how you can engage the technology as a social partner in learning. Great. Well, that's, uh, that's fantastic, so some, some practical examples there. And at that point, I think I will now go out, out to the audience um, and see if you have any questions for our speakers. So um, <coughs> maybe what I'll do is if I take, I'll take a couple and then, and then come back, so I'll take, I'll take two, yeah. I'd like to have a question. question. Yeah. And it's about, um, well, there's two things, there's two observations, really. Um, one is about how certain schools in the UK with kids who have reading difficulty, mm -hmm. use dogs for the kid to read to the dog. Mm. And again, the dog sits there and looks at the kid, you know, with big Adoring. eyes and, and doesn't say anything, but just kind of, there's a bond between the dog and the, and the child and the reading ability of that child, rather than sitting with someone who's kind of telling the child how to read, the reading mm. ability of the child sitting in front of the dog increases quite, you know, there, there aren't any proper research studies about it, but quite a few observational uh, studies have been done. And, you know, I've seen some of the, 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 the footage, how the child's sort of, over time, reading to the dog increases their reading mm -hmm. ability. 
the second thing I wanted to raise, which is also to do with the, the language acquisition thing, is about, um, <coughs> I was at a conference in Africa, and I, I do some work in Africa, and there was someone there from the African Union who's kind of the big board in African languages. And he told an amazing story about rural kids in Africa who, you know, when they're like five or six years old, they speak their local language, they go to school, they get taught in English, they get the picture of the cow they've got in their little yard at home, exactly looking like the cow they've got at home. They cannot make the association between that cow and the cow they've got in. So the English cow or the English uh, is different to what they've got at home. And I think that's something quite interesting because in the West we don't think about language acquisition like that. So I just wanted to kind of throw that at you to sort of get your kind of gauge on this. Yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah. Thanks very much. Let's take a couple of other questions and we'll come back to the, the panel. Okay. Fantastic. Go for it. Hi. Um, you spoke about MOOCs at the beginning. Um, and I'd love to know what you both think of the digital learning environments we're seeing this year with virtual reality. And can that be an effective learning environment? Okay, great. We'll take one more. Well, apparently it's going to me first. Uh, over here. Uh, sorry, sorry. Okay, we'll come to you later. Yeah, go for it. Cool, sorry. Um, I suppose since uh, Africa, the country was just mentioned now, um, it's very easy to talk about building a rapport to increase learning, but in a lot of the developing world, there's still very strong reverence for, um, for your elders mm. as people that you can't interact with on that level, right? Um, so often it's very difficult to, to try and create a rapport between students and teachers and even, even amongst their own family. Um, so for startups perhaps based in, in, the, in the developing world in, in Africa and in India, um, how, do we, how do we, even on a lo-fi level, um, try and encourage that kind of rapport. I don't know if you guys have any advice on, on what to consider there. Thanks. That's great. So thanks for the questions. We've got questions on um, reading and language acquisition, a question about MOOCs, and a question about building building rapport between students and, and teachers. So uh, Justine, if I go to you first, sure. uh, respond to any of those you like. Barbara Rogoff, who's an um, educational anthropologist, has done really lovely work on how Mexican students uh, from Mexico City primarily in the US are so likely to fail in classes where they know the subject matter. And as an ethnographer, she looked at their home context and learned that respect translates into silence. And you would never speak in an environment where an adult is present because that would indicate that you think you know better than the adult. And so these children who know perfectly well the answer to a question would never dream of saying that answer out loud. It would be disrespectful. However, in many countries across the African continent where respect for teachers is primary in the school experience, respect for the child can also be put in place. And in the US, several studies have shown that children who feel respected by their teachers make larger learning gains than those who feel disrespected. And so I don't think in any way that respect for a teacher is antithetical to rapport, nor that respect is antithetical to learning. I think that's one thing that we really need to to keep um, in mind. And second, just quickly, about virtual reality and MOOCs. A lot of what we think of today as educational technology, I would see as a medium for education, not an educational technology. So a video link is a medium. Virtual reality is a medium. A laptop that's stuck in every school in uh, an emerging country is a medium. What matters is what you do with it. And that is at least as true of virtual reality as any other medium out there. Do you present a story and have no engagement with it? Well, remember that old cliche that 
students learn what they say and not what the teacher says. And so in virtual reality, as in many other environments, unless there's engagement, it's not experiential by definition. Virtual reality is not engagement or um, experience by definition. It can be just as much of a funnel unless it's built so that the learners themselves are engaging with content. So I'll just stop there to... to uh, maybe I'll, I'll probably focus a little bit on the MOOCs and the VR. Um, so on the MOOC side, um, we've done two things to kind of experiment with, I guess, um, uh, slightly different approaches, but built around this idea of the MOOC. Uh, one was um, something called Learning Creative Learning, which is uh, essentially, so when I came to the Media Lab originally as a director's fellow, um, my, my background had been, I'd done a lot of online learning building online learning communities. And I started talking to people at the Media Lab and the, the Media Lab had never offered an online course. Uh, and the person who was most uh, interested in learning uh, was a professor called Mitchell Resnick, or still is, and kind of actually was a student of Seymour's. And uh, I know you've written together and worked together. And so, um, so we started talking about why hasn't the Media Lab ever offered an online course and what's happening with these MOOCs. And you know, he was very critical of the MOOCs for many of the reasons you mentioned. Uh, I was very critical of the MOOCs because it felt like, um, it didn't feel like the learners had uh, uh, any sense of agency or control or contribution, so I was more interested in open source software communities. So learning creative learning was like our approach, and we actually wrote a uh, post about it called Tinkering with MOOCs, is how do you bring kind of project-based learning, uh, communities, uh, those, those things that we cared about, how do you bring that into the MOOC space? And learning creative learning is still around. It's running again now. Uh, tens of thousands of people have participated. Uh, we talk about it as a community rather than a course. Um, but so that's, I think, one in experiment. And then the other one is I co-founded a nonprofit organization called Peer-to-Peer -Peer University, uh, which brought people together uh, in small groups online uh, with the, the kind of very utopian and, and naive premise that you could learn anything you wanted if you just got together with a bunch of other people online and you'd, you'd find the materials. Um, and uh, you know, it was moderately successful, but m mostly with people who were already highly educated. And uh, about four years ago, we started working with public libraries and actually bringing people together face to face in public libraries. And public libraries are an amazing institution. And I could talk about libraries for an hour, <laughs> but um, it's completely changed the way peer-to-peer -peer university works. Even though it's still the same idea, you bring people together in these small supportive groups uh, using online course materials. Um, but we reach a completely different audience. Uh, we reach people who've dropped out of uh, college, didn't succeed in education, are coming back from incarceration. Uh, homeless people uh, show up to these um, learning circles. And the retention and completion rates are much, much higher than they ever were in the online only space. So sometimes, uh, you know, adding a very old technology, which is the public library, to something new and exciting and shiny actually makes the new and shiny thing much more useful. Um, and VR, um, I think VR is super exciting, uh, but uh, it's like for what purpose, for what end in what context, uh, you know, like I think you can do lots of exciting things with VR, but you can also use it as uh, an attempt to pour things into other people's, into learners' heads, and I don't think that's gonna be very successful. But if it's a medium for exploration, uh, once it becomes interactive also, I think right now it's still, uh, like the cardboards are exciting, the, the lower end VR applications, but they're very consumptive. You're watching something that someone else has created. You're not really shaping it or, or having an experience in it. I think once we get to the next level, or AR also I think is maybe more interesting at the moment than VR. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited about it. There are lots of people at the Media Lab working in VR and AR. Uh, we're not, it's a little early to see what exactly it's gonna look like in the future, but it's definitely, it's, uh, I think it's worthwhile uh, focusing on. That's great, thank you both. So we'll go out for another round of questions now. Um, yeah, gentleman at the back there. Hi, um, so many interesting points and so much readings to do from what you mentioned. <laughs> and some of the work that, uh, some of the points that you mentioned from Wizard could really affect a lot the work that we're trying to do in Asia. Um, but what would you suggest to be a way, or maybe a, a website or a resource where one can find some of the best 
material in a digestible way for a non-researcher <laughs> or PhD student that we can try to bring some of this work to practice and test it out. Great, great question. Take a couple more. Yeah, uh, just wait for the mic. So I, I've been wondering for a while whether the LMS of the futures, the, the LMS of the future might be something like Slack or Discord rather than something designed specifically for learning. Uh, and you helped crystallize that insight. Um, should we be starting with the places where people do talk and, um, um, and test their beliefs um, and add the education or classroom management features onto those rather than building separate le learning environments that seem not to produce a lot of true collaboration or conversation? Great. Great question. And any more? Yeah. Hey, thank you for the talk. You just mentioned in one of the statements that learning is social. Also, there was another statement where you said that learning happens as a part of internal conflict as well, right? So if I take a scenario of where I'm just simply reading a book and there is nobody around me and I'm still learning a lot. So how does this statement go uh, with the point that learning is social as well? Uh, like is, is it, is, is yeah. that our scenario learning yeah. is social and yeah. Uh, conflict as well, or, or how is it? Yeah, what's your views on that? Fantastic, thank you for those. So, three great questions there. So, uh, is there a website or resource that you can recommend? What are the best kind of learning environments? Maybe Slack, is that a better, 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 better one to start from something like that? And what about this point about learning is social? If you read a book, you learn, is, is that social? How does that work? So, uh, I'll start with Philip this time. Um, so that's a great question. I'm actually really curious uh, to hear your answer, but I would say reading a book is in a way also social because you are engaging with the author of the book, right? So you are having a conversation and it's also conflict if you're learning because the ideas coming out of the book, you are engaging with those and maybe there, there's a tension between what you thought or what you think. Um, but I also think there are limitations to, uh, to that setting which if you have other people, other points of view, uh, in the in the in your context, there's the likelihood of interesting learning to happen. I think is larger or is higher. Um, um, I think there's a bunch of good conferences. I mean, this is you know obviously one uh, the digital media and learning community in the U.S. I think has a pretty good sense of what's going on on the more creative side. Um, Learn.media.mit.edu is our website where we try to kind of uh, showcase some of the stuff that's coming out of the media lab specifically. Um, and then um, totally agree, uh, don't, uh, so I'm not a fan of learning management systems. Even the word learning management <laughs> is like, like we're managing learners and we're managing learning and it's like the industrial model. Uh, so for learning creative learning, we've, uh, we've actually used a whole range of different tools over the years, but we've al always used tools that were kind of either open source or available platforms. So we've used Google Plus initially uh, we now use something called Discourse, which is an open source discussion forum that's, that's very good. Um, we've built a WebRTC kind of live uh, system, but yeah, definitely use the tools that people use to communicate with each other and then add the, the learning I into those, I think is a good strategy. Um, so using these machine learning algorithms on uh, learners sitting in a group and trying to build something. We find that we can predict learning through the behavior of one student if that student comes in with a deeply held belief and is somehow compelled to challenge that belief. So I have personal experience of this. Uh, I taught at the, I was a professor at MIT uh, for almost a decade in the Media Lab. And uh, I got my tenure there in 2002. Um, and I, when I first arrived, I wanted to teach a course on human conversation and discourse for and nonverbal behavior for interactive systems. And the first year I taught it, I found out that the many computer scientists and engineers who came to take classes and who were students in the Media Lab believed that all of this was common sense and they had nothing to learn from me. And that first year was pretty much a disaster. So the second year and all the subsequent years, I started the class every year with an exercise, really simple. Watch this video and write down all the words that single person says and the person's nonverbal behavior. You're only gonna have to do that for four minutes. And then we'll play it back in slow motion. And the students found, to their surprise, 
that they had captured around 50% of what was said. But it, but it was common sense. How could it be so hard? And that was a way of, from the start, engaging them in a cognitive conflict, taking a belief that they took for granted and challenging it. And books can do that well if they're well written. And books that aren't well written can't. Um, I would say as far as resources, so uh, many faculty members have um, layperson uh, explanations of what they do. My own group, which is called the Articulab, we have a website where we have videos and explanations of each of our projects. And it's the only Articulab, I think, in, on the web, so you can look that up pretty easily. Um, as far as using Slack and existent tools, I think that points to finding students where they are and then building for them, as opposed to building something and saying to yourself, if I build, they will come. <laughs> That's never really worked in educational technology, no matter how whizzy gig your, your device is. Or if it does work, it works, and then it doesn't work. It, it hits motivation, and then motivation fades. And this is why we do this crazy thing, my students and I, which is to videotape kids with no adults and no digital technology in the room. And we spent four years on a data set of 12 pairs of children. And we looked at every eyebrow raise and every wave of the hand and everything they said to understand where they were. What's the part that's making them learn? And we correlated it with what they knew about science beforehand, actually linear algebra in this case, and what they knew about linear algebra at the end so that we could pinpoint which of their behaviors when there is no adult in the room predicts learning. Now, how can we amplify that if we can with a piece of technology? And I'm pretty much a Luddite for a, uh, somebody who develops technologies. If a technology can't do it better, I won't use a technology. So that's how I, I would say we ensure that um, we're not wrecking things. <laughs> we're not making it worse. We're making it better by starting where the learner is and where groups of learners are. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a lovely point to end on, starting where the learner is and where the learners are. Wonderful. Thank you. We're, um, we're the opposite of yeah. an online course, by the way. We started with yeah. few people and we're ending with yeah. many. <laughs> we have like inverse <laughs> yeah, retention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. Well, thanks everyone for your time. Thanks Thank to our two speakers. Very stimulating talks there. And I hope that helps all the uh, ed tech people amongst us uh, to go away and then do a better job. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.